So I like to delve a bit into your background and explore how your previous experiences have influenced your, your success as an entrepreneur. Can you share with me how important uh, studying the history of science, for example, was to your later success as an entrepreneur? While I was at MIT, one of the degrees I took was in the history of science. And the focus was science, technology, and society. Of course, MIT is known as an engineering school, and uh, my other uh, my other degree was in aeronautical engineering and uh, spaceship design. So, engineering is normally thought of as uh, dry and uh, and rigorous. On the other hand, um, the history of science is all about the invention of new techniques and how they got used within the society where they're introduced. And so, uh, politics and economics and sociology all have an impact. And, and I think in the history of science, it gave me an appreciation for things like network effects. For example, um, uh, you know, the Romans developed a certain width for a Roman road and uh, Roman chariots had an impact on that. And eventually that width found its way into a railroad track and then if you made cars that were that width, then you could move them on the railroads. But if a nation changed the gauge of the railroad track, then all the trains would be incompatible from the foreign country. And then when you shipped to the border, you'd have to transship or move your cargo from one set of trains and one rolling stock to a different set of trains. And so the decision to create an M compatible technology protocol might have profound economic consequences, might have political consequences, might start a war, or might uh, might discourage one. You know, the history of the sciences, it, it's about lots of sciences. How do we introduce um, uh, steel in an age of iron? And what happens when iron comes along and replaces uh, bronze? And what happens if you don't master iron, if you don't master steel? I mean, one of the famous books is Guns, Germs, and Steel. And it's all about the impact of guns on uh, the colonization of the New World. And why did the Europeans end up dominating uh, North America and South America and civilization? And some of it has to do with immunology and the fact that the Europeans managed to infect each other so much that they had stronger immune systems. And when they showed up in the New world, the germs they brought killed most of the inhabitants without a fight. If you just study political history, uh, oftentimes political history is told from the point of view of, of people said things and did things. But when you study the history of science, you realize that it didn't really matter what the people said or what they did. Um, <laughs> when uh, Columbus showed up in the New World, uh, they tried to bring back something like 18 natives on the ship to Spain. Every one of them just died. They didn't know why they died, but they all just dropped dead. So the political interest or the, the, the human ambition is thwarted by something they don't understand. In this case, they didn't have natural immunity to the diseases that all the Europeans carried. I mean, the history of science causes you to think about how the civilization developed uh, based not upon ideology, not upon ambition. Yeah. It's not the story of a politician that came to save us. It's not the story of an ideology that transcended. Uh, perhaps it's the story of this people had iron deposits and that people did not. And so the people with the iron deposits made harder weapons and killed the ones without the iron deposits. Or this people had the Nile River and the Nile River was hydropower. And if you have, uh, have a source of, of uh, hydropower energy, then you have a natural advantage when it comes to agriculture and then your society is going to dominate. Two interesting takeaways uh, that are relevant to the modern era. One is you come to the conclusion that the civilization of the society that channels energy most effectively generally wins, whether it's channeling energy by replacing a spear with a bow and arrow or replacing a bow and arrow with a catapult or replacing a, a, a catapult with a cannon or replacing the 
cannon with a battleship and replacing that with an aircraft and replacing that with a nuclear weapon. Land power, you know, is trumped by sea power, is trumped by air power, is trumped by space power, is trumped by nuclear power. And uh, there's a, just a relentless progression of, of these sophisticated societies that learned how to channel energy and channeling energy at a certain rate and with a certain focus would be power, almost the definition of power, the, the rate at which you deliver the energy. The, the second, I think, takeaway from the history of science is that, is that science, the history of science is punctuated by paradigm shifts. There was a time when uh, people thought that the universe revolved around the Earth. The Copernican revolution uh, was this idea that maybe it, it uh, didn't. The paradigm shifts take place when you develop a new instrument. So it was optics, it was the telescope that caused human beings to realize that the universe did not revolve around the Earth. Once they had the telescope and they could see the moons of Jupiter, they started to realize that you couldn't really explain the movement of certain moons and, and certain bodies in the solar system based upon the old theory, right? The Ptolemaic theory of the world. And they had to adopt a new theory, maybe maybe things revolved around something other than the Earth, perhaps the sun. There's a similar breakthrough in medicine, not by the telescope, but by the microscope, where we thought that disease was caused by spirits <laughs> and demons and all sorts of other random things. And there was a lot of superstition there. But then when we looked at blood and we looked at, at fluids, we realized there are actually living creatures in those, uh, in those fluids. And we just uh, developed the entire, uh, you know, medical science of immunology and, and germ theory. And we started making breakthroughs because we could see. Then there's a pushback, the pushback against uh, the idea that the earth might revolve around the sun came from the forces of, of authority, the establishment. Partly it was the church, but partly it was, it was uh, the monarchy and just government in general. The, the system had been constructed based on a system of authority where you got your truth from a very powerful central organization. And if and that truth had adopted a certain set of theories and this challenged the theories and therefore challenged central power. And there was naturally gonna be a friction. So much so that you might very well get jailed, deplatformed or burned or bankrupted if you push the new paradigm. And Galileo is a, maybe one of the more famous examples of that. There's a Dr. Harvey in the history of medicine uh, he put forth the proposition that the heart pumped blood through the arteries and, and recycled it back through the veins. And of course, for thousands and thousands of years, no one thought that. They didn't actually think the heart pumped blood. They didn't know, they didn't understand circulation at all. And, and Harvey discovered this and it was, it was a pretty big breakthrough, but it was so profoundly revolutionary that no one would accept it. And the entire medical establishment rejected it. And Harvey's very famous for a quote. He said, no doctor over the age of 40 will ever believe me, right? And uh, it leads us to one of the funnier statements in the history of science. Science advances one death at a time, which is, which is uh, maybe articulated uh, by Thomas Kuhn as paradigm shifts take place when the old generation or the old guard dies. You have to wait for an entire generation of power and authority, whether it's in science or whether it's in politics or whether it's in the religious establishment, you have to wait for them to just pass. Or um, that uh, dogma passes in the event of a war. You're adamantly in favor of fighting wars with uh, horses. And then someone comes along with tanks and machine guns and you realize your horses don't work anymore, then you discard that, I think, uh, Billy Mitchell was court-martialed because he suggested that air power would dominate future wars in the 20s or the 30s. And uh, the military establishment didn't like that, so they court-martialed him. And then, of course, by World War II, we found that perhaps air power did matter in wars. And so people change their views towards science when there's a mortality event. Uh, you know, if, if your country is coming to an end or your life is coming to an end, you're willing to be open-minded. Otherwise, if it's not a matter of life or death, people typically cling to the old paradigm 
until they pass. And you just have to wait for a new generation that, that has a new set of circumstances to embrace new ideas. I think that that's what I took away from the history of science. And that has helped me a lot. My life as an entrepreneur and, and when I eventually, uh, you know, discovered uh, Bitcoin, it helped me to understand both why it was so profoundly powerful, but also why it was profoundly difficult for the establishment to understand. Hey, thanks for watching. Don't forget to give us a like and also hit that subscribe button below.